the granny cave is all I could think of during this chapter, man. <laughs> granny said Suno has got a fat pad hidden underneath her uh, little shitty looking diner. Gourmet number 67, Secrets of Setsuno's Diner. And it's not even complete. Well, hello, my brothers and sisters of the Nerd Nation. I, as always, am Jim here to bring you another review on the awesome, mouth-watering, and just ingredient-filled tale of Toriko. Our last chapter saw us with, uh, we, we thought, the century soup, of course, that had been prepared and given to Komatsu uh, and, uh, and Toriko to taste or to eat was, uh, we, we thought that was the deal. Now, at the, towards the end of it, Komatsu went and he said, you know, it tastes like it's actually missing something, right? And Granny Setsuno really enjoyed, um, I, I think she really had a lot of respect for Komatsu and not only just his, uh, j that he has a lot of potential, obviously, as, as a chef, and that he was able to pick out some of the different ingredients and stuff that she used in, in, in that and that garlic chicken. But really, I wasn't sure if she was, like, offended or what at the end, because she didn't really say anything. She was just like, I gotta take you to my real kitchen. And that was, but that was immediately after Komatsu said it, it tastes like it's missing something. So I kind of had a feeling that it wasn't the complete soup. And we wind up finding out in this chapter, it's really cool because you go and you get uh, Granny, you know, goes and opens up the secret trap door that goes down and, you know, into her secret lair and what have you. And I guess the castle next door, she actually owns that too. Um, but so she's got this secret lair down into her kitchen. And you get down in there, and I mean, it's like this huge warehouse looking thing, man, that she's got stuff everywhere for the preparation and whatnot of her over different meals. And. As they're walking through this 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 fun house, I mean, it's just it's absolutely astounding to see some of the stuff. And uh, Kamatsu almost gets his face bit off and freaks out about these uh, these just beasts that he sees or whatever fighting. And I guess they're called uh, called like a lonely grizzlies, I think they were called. And uh, and apparently their meat's very tough normally, but if you actually go and pit males against each other, so they fight and whatnot for a certain amount of time, an undisclosed amount of time. Um, there's, there's this one, this small window of a few minutes where their meat becomes super tender and that's when you knock them out and, and obviously, you know, take the meat, prepare them, whatever. And they explain a number of different things. There's a few different things that he winds up talking about. Um, you know, the, these leeks that have to be these, uh, these, uh, the peach potatoes that have to be soaked in four degrees Celsius temperature, you know, ice water for a year to get the slime off of them. And I guess these things kind of fall under the, uh, you know, the uh, requires a special attention or extra preparation. But really, it's it's a testament to Granny Satsuno and just how much of a badass chef that she actually is. Um, you know, to say that she's a rock star or a legend or a living legend or whatever the hell you want to call her uh, is an understatement. She knows things about these ingredients that, that probably no one else in this world knows, you know. And it's really cool to see, just to see all this different stuff. And then, then just, like I said, I love just the, the background, the depth and the detail uh, that, that is given you know, and it makes it sound believable, it makes it sound plausible, it makes it sound like these things are real, you know. And because a lot of them are rooted in real things, you know, like peaches and potatoes are real, there's no peach potatoes. But, realistically, it's cool because the explanation makes so much sense that you're like, oh yeah, that sounds legit, sounds legit, you know. <laughs> so, um, so we get this little kind of walk around tour of this just grand, you know, underground area that she has there. And then, so then Komatsu's like, once he talks to Toriko about a few of these different things, he's like, oh, I see, that's why she's only open once a month, because it takes so long to prepare everything, right? And she's like, and she comes swinging in like George of the Jungle on this rope, you know, from across this other platform, and she's like, no, that's not it, wrong. <laughs> Swings back across the rope and says, come on, follow me this way. So uh, they, 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 they follow her and what have you, swing across, Komatsu almost falls, Toriko catches him, you know, and they go into this other room, and... She explains to Komatsu, she says, really, I just kind of manage things over here. The ingredients, she says, there's no chef in the world that's that's worth his, his own salt that actually believes that the chef makes the ingredients and pairs them. She says that the ingredients choose the customer. The ingredients choose the other ingredients, and the chef is basically just there to kind of guide them and put them into place. And it's a really neat explanation when you think about it, because it's basically like, hey, listen, she's saying this a lot of this stuff is out of my hands, uh, it's really kind of like when the ingredients, you know, tell me that they want to be eaten, when they want to be prepared. Then I come and prepare them, that's when I open up. And it's, like I said, it's a real neat explanation to it because some of this stuff, uh, you know, it's gone to such great lengths to go and create uh, this world and, and all these different ingredients. And that, that's what this whole, whole manga is based on, right? Is these various just crazy fucking gourmet ingredients. 
So to but to go and to think that you know that, that that's how things are prepared, and, and it's funny because there's a lot of parallels to, to chefs in real life. A lot of a lot of chefs really truly believe that it, it's not the way that they prepare things. It's just it's 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 the it's the pairing of the ingredients that would have naturally happened, and this and that. They almost feel like they're just sort of a guide, uh, you know, guiding them on their on their food journey, you know. So I thought that was cool. But when they walk into this room, there's like this 40 foot tall vat of soup. It's this giant pot right with a ladle hanging from it that's like the size of three human beings right and uh and granny just goes and she's just like Ring! she's a spry old lady she just jumps up there and <laughs> come on, like is she even human you know and tori goes like come on we got a lot of climbing to do so they climb up to the top and then she goes and she breaks it down and the whole point of this chapter and the last one was to go and break down into set up and to paint a little bit of the canvas to give you a little bit of the picture in the background for this actual arc and what we're going to do in this ice hell and everything else right she explains the century soup obviously it's all these different ingredients that are you know boiled down over six months and then you got to skim the uh, the scum basically off the top so it becomes pure and pure and pure but she explains that this is not, this is like an imitation. It's like a copy of the century soup. The real deal century soup, I guess, occurs naturally in nature. And the last time Jiro was the one that wound up hooking her up with this, this missing ingredient or whatever, whatever it was uh, she wound up having from him last time. The way I took it was that, well, she's old as shit. And, and this only occurs every century. So this is right about the time that it's going to occur. Uh, it, to be able to get this ingredient, but she's not even aware of what ingredient it is. So that's why she was like, you know, she she looks at Kamatsu and she's like, that's why I have respect for you. No one out of all the billionaires, you know, uh, the billionaire playboys, the uh, you know the the the, the um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, high up officials, things like that. You know, government, politicians, whatever. All these people that have eaten her food, nobody's ever went and just told her like, hey, this is what I think, or I think this is missing something, whatever. And Kamatsu, though, she liked the way he was forward and the way he actually was just, you know, he blurted things out and told her things about it and gave her his opinion. But she thinks that he has that potential to be able to be the person coupled with Toriko and obviously, you know, his just being a big badass gourmet hunter to actually go out into the wild or wherever it may be where this, wherever this natural green is because she wants to make the real deal century soup. She's like, yeah, this is great. But don't you want to try the real century soup? And Toriko's like, oh, yeah, I'm on board, right? And then she's like, Komatsu, how about you? You know, and and he, Toriko's like, come on, Komatsu would be great. And he's like, yeah, sure, I'm on board. So then she goes and she kind of goes, and you see like this little sort of like, you know, bubble over her head or whatever, and she's talking about this guy. It's this older bearded looking dude or whatever, right? And uh, and apparently he's getting some people together and whatnot to send out or to take out on this expedition. She thinks that he'll hire Toriko in, in a heartbeat. And like I said, this is the whole deal. This is the whole thing. This is painting the picture for us now because whatever this missing ingredient is, um, she doesn't even know what it is, but this is what's going to go and take us on our journey. And it really, like I said, it just, it does a great job. And I like too how it, he doesn't, it, it doesn't bother him if there's like, you know, if he spends two or three or four chapters kind of going and building that, building that hype, building it up. Because the chapters are still so interesting for me anyway, that it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter if people are getting thrown around and Toriko's punching guys in the face and everything else. That's cool. But really for me, it's all about the explanation. It's all about the world. It's all about the ingredients. It's all about those type of things. So having this get set up like this and realizing that this is a once in a hundred year chance type of thing, has got me freaking stoked, brothers and sisters. I was going to say brother, but uh, there's obviously sisters as well of the nation. So according to, uh, you know, YouTube statistics, 24% now. <laughs> so anyway, uh, nonetheless, I tried to, uh, you know, try to acknowledge and remember that there is both uh, that watch, male and female. So my chapter question, though, is, is really, I guess, now once we saw uh, Granny's, you know, uh, secret kitchen and everything else, what are your thoughts on what Granny said about the, um, what Granny said sooner, what she said in that kind of speech she gave to Kamatsu about the ingredients kind of choosing, the ingredients they want to pair up with and choosing the, the customers, the people they want to eat, as opposed to the chef being in control of everything. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, you know, and obviously for those of you that have cooked uh, before or do cook or, or you know, have an appreciation for it as well, uh, feel free to share, you know, any experiences or, or maybe what your favorite dish is or your favorite dish to cook or eat uh, and leave that in the comments down below feel free to hit the thumbs up the like button if you should think that i deserve it and subscribe if you have not done so already we will look forward to catching all of you in the next one nation remember to follow me over on my other channel as well as twitter and facebook